Okay, great. So um, on behalf of William Darrow, Malcolm Holmline, and myself, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this session on recalibration and negotiation, the US, Iran, and the wider Middle East. We're very fortunate to have Ambassador Dennis Ross and Daniel Pletka joining us for this conversation. Each of them is going to speak for five or 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And as we just discussed, uh, we're on the record. Um, by way of background, Ambassador Ross is counselor and William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He served two years as special assistant to President Obama and National Security Council Senior Director for the Central Region and a year as special advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. For more than 12 years, Ambassador Ross played a leading role in shaping U.S. involvement in the Middle East peace process and dealing directly with the parties in negotiations. A highly skilled diplomat, Ambassador Ross was U.S. point man in the peace process in both the George Bush and Bill Clinton administrations and was instrumental in assisting Israelis and Palestinians to reach the 1995 interim agreement. And he also successfully brokered the 1997 Hebron Accord, facilitated the 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty and intensively worked in bring, to bring Israel and Syria together. Ambassador Ross is the author of several influential books on the peace process, the Middle East, and international relations. Um, with that introduction, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Look, I'm gonna to try to uh, frame our conversation, at least from my standpoint, in the following way. Uh, we have a new, we will have a new Iranian president, uh, and he is portrayed as a hardliner, which I think is, more than fair. I mean, describing him as a hanging judge might be more appropriate. Uh, but he really is a principalist, uh, just like the Supreme Leader is a principalist. And what principalist means is that they adhere to the principles of the Islamic Republic. Uh, and two of those principles are an altering, uh, an altering opposition to the United States and a kind of determination to maintain a kind of constant pressure on Israel with the aim of at some point having Israel no longer be a, a state, a nation state in the region. Uh, and I think it's, you know, when we, when we think about that as a point of departure, it doesn't mean by definition that this is a leadership that won't be capable of adjustment. They'll make adjustments. And I do believe even though there's a kind of an emerging conventional wisdom now that it's less likely or at least it's becoming less clear that there'll be a reconstitution of the JCPOA. Uh, I don't buy that. I think there will be a reconstitution of the JCPOA. I think the Iranian approach is being shaped by building pressure on us. I think the desire for, uh, and even the necessity of sanctions relief on their side will lead them to want to come back into it. But their posture at this point is one of pushing their nuclear program ahead uh, now, obviously, enriching to 60%, doing R&D and producing uranium metal, which is a key component if you want to have a, a bomb, uh, pushing ahead with their uh, installing advanced centrifuges and the like. Uh, and they're using that and their, the appearance of being patient when it comes to getting sanctions relief as a way of putting pressure on us to get more. In effect, what they want is what I call more for less. They want to get more in terms of what they are entitled to with regard to sanctions relief, and they want to give up less. Uh, and what I mean by giving up less, it doesn't mean they won't go back to the numerical limits uh, that would be imposed on them by the JCPOA. What it does mean is that in the areas where they are doing things that they can't unlearn, like, for example, the installing at least four cascades of advanced centrifuges, uh, you know, that is a knowledge base and ex experiential base that can't be undone. Uh, so we're looking at this as a reality. Now, the, the moment you come back into the JCPOA, uh, and, you know, I mean, we can get into discussion. I, I, I think it's going to happen. The question is what you do in the aftermath of that. But the moment you do, they will have more resources available, uh, and they will, in fact, be prepared to apply that uh, in the region. Now, how does this relate to the question that you were asking about what are the implications of, of withdrawal from Afghanistan and the impact on the region? 
as it might relate to the Iranians. Interestingly enough, withdrawal from Afghanistan probably is a mixed blessing from the Iranian standpoint. Uh, on the one hand, the appearance of the U.S. withdrawing, they hope will be, uh, will presage more such withdrawals from the region because they want us out of the region. On the other hand, they almost went to war with the Taliban before. Uh, and, you know, this is, this suggests that Afghanistan may not be uh, so, look so great from their standpoint. Uh, the, the issue of pushing us out of the region will remain part of their approach. We're certainly seeing it uh, within Iraq. Uh, we're seeing an increase in terms of Shia militias targeting bases where the United States are at, and it's clearly part of the effort uh, to drive us out. The Biden administration, and we, again, we can get into the discussion, the Biden administration is not the Obama administration. Uh, I think that it, unlike the Obama administration, and especially President Obama himself, who felt that if we were more active in countering the Iranians in the region, that this might threaten the implementation of the JCPOA, that's not, I think, where the Biden administration comes from. I think they want back in the JCPOA because they, they want to reverse uh, what is the Iranian advance uh, of their nuclear program. Uh, but I also think they understand they're going to have to counter, they're going to have to join with, uh, with the Israelis and others in figuring the best ways to counter what the Iranians are doing in the region. Uh, the Iranians will, I think, try to continue to, to build the pressures uh, in this regard. And as I said, they will be doing more in the aftermath of the JCPOA uh, rather than less. And I think the, the key issue is not what whether the U.S. is getting out of Afghanistan. The key issue is what is the U.S. prepared to do in terms of countering the Iranians in the aftermath of the reconstitution of the JCPOA when Iran becomes more active in the region? We've seen the administration do one thing that the Obama administration did not do, and that's retaliate uh, against the Shia militias uh, for attacks uh, on us. I guess that, that might be a bit of an overstatement. The Obama administration may have done it once or twice. But I think even the nature of the retaliation at this point uh, is one that is probably not sending kind of message, at least at this point, that I think it probably needs to. What I mean by that is the following. We have been so calibrated uh, in the, the two times that we've chosen to respond to attacks, and there's been around 30 such attacks uh, on bases where we're located. Uh, we've been so calibrated in, in our response that the messages were more concerned about escalation or preventing escalation than we are about imposing a price on the Iranians. Yeah, the most recent attack, it's true, it's, they're being done now more by drones and less by cruise missiles. Uh, but the most recent attack actually involved hitting the, the dining room of our embassy in the green zone. Uh, and that suggests that our responses to date, rather than signaling that the Iranians and their, their proxies can't do this with impunity, what it signaled is uh, the Iranians have figured out that we, will, we are so concerned about escalation uh, that they can actually do more. So if we're going to counter the Iranians in the aftermath of the JCPOA, and I'm making that premise that I think it will be reconstituted, as I said, we're going to have to do more when it comes to deterrence uh, if we want to affect the Iranian calculus. I think that is much more important than the actual withdrawal from Afghanistan. So why don't I stop there and, and Danny can take over. Sorry, I put myself on mute because I want to avoid any background noise. I apologize. So Danielle Pletka is a senior fellow in foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise. You didn't read my message, Diane. And I said, don't read a long bio for me, please. I don't like that, it. You don't want a long bio? Great. I don't. Okay. Well, I... Um, Danny focuses on U.S. policy generally and the Middle East specifically. She's well known to a number of us as she's spoken to us. Uh, many times. And Danny, we're very interested in hearing your insights on uh, Iran as well. So thank you very much for joining us. 
Well, thank you, Diane. What I said to Diane in my note was, first of all, it's going to encourage invidious comparisons with Dennis's resume, which you read out in almost full beforehand. And uh, and I certainly don't want that. But also, I do I do think it's a waste of everybody's time. I don't just know some of you. I'm willing to bet I know almost every single one of you on this call. And I think Dennis can probably say the same thing. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for having me uh, again. It's always a pleasure and especially a, a pleasure to, to, to talk to you. You guys with them um, with Dennis uh, in, for whom I have very very high regard and have for low the three plus decades we've known each other ah! uh, <laughs> <laughs> in any case look there are a lot of places to, to, to go here and and the temptation is obviously um, when we're talking about this to a either disagree with the other person who spoke um, and lay, lay out why it is that I think yeah, he might be wrong. And the other is to to pile onto the Biden administration for uh, wanting to rejoin what is probably one of the most flawed international agreements uh, we've seen in recent years. I'm not going to do that in large part because I don't think there's a, a, a great point. I don't think that we know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dennis suggests that he thinks that it that it's going to happen, and and basically, I think, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Dennis, but I think your implication is that the Iranians are driving a very hard bargain, understanding that this administration really wants to do this deal, and so they're gonna they are going to, in very typical uh, Iranian fashion, try to um, try to get the best possible deal they can. I think that's a, a good tactic for them. Um, I don't know where it's going to end. I do think that the Iranians um, have a tendency to overplay their hand. I also think that it's important when we talk about where we're going with the Iranians, whether it's on their nuclear program or on its, whether it's about their regional behavior, that we talk about their domestic situation. Dennis rightly brought up the recent election of, of incoming President Raisi. Yes, he's a principalist, he's a hardliner. All of these expressions are mostly, you know, meaningless. Um, you know, he's, he's meaner and tougher and nastier than Rouhani. He is a repudiation of the um, so-called uh, reformist tendencies uh, of the Rouhani administration. And, uh, and he was the choice because these are not real elections. He was the choice of the Supreme Leader. But the Supreme Leader himself is, is, is old, I think is very worried about his legacy. Indeed, Raisi is the person who has been talked about almost exclusively really for the last five years or so as a likely successor to the Supreme Leader. Now, how that would work is a little bit confusing to me. If one is the president and the Supreme Leader dies, does the president become, I don't know. That's, uh, that's out, of my, uh, out of my wheelhouse. But, uh, but suffice it to say, this is actually a period of great instability for Iran. And where I think this administration is going wrong is in failing to appreciate just how much Iran needs this deal. I, Iran plays a good game. They play a, they play hardball very, very capably, and they always have. But if you looked at the news today, you can see that there are protests all over Iran. There are water shortages. There are electricity shortages. You can also see in one of the reports that my colleagues at the Critical Threats Project at AEI put out that in May of this year, Iran put the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and you all know what that is, but anyone who doesn't raise your hand, and I'll, I'll say so, but they put the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in charge of nuclear security. Okay. That's interesting, and it's interesting for a whole variety of reasons. Part of the reason for that is because they are increasingly being penetrated by, you name it, Israel. Uh, in, there, was a, there was a June drone attack on a facility making very important parts for Iranian nuclear weapons uh, that, uh, that got very little attention. Why did it get very little attention? Probably because the Iranians didn't want it to get a lot of attention. Why? Because they did not want the reputation of the IRGC sullied so early in their tenure as nuclear guardians. But what this really signals, I think, is, a, is an increased commitment to that program and an increased worry about its, uh, about its security. All of those things suggest that they need the heat off them, right? They need the money, they need the heat off them on the nuclear program. And those are important things for the outside world looking to rejoin the JCPOA to consider.
I think it's also important to understand that our European allies uh, are actually a lot less enthusiastic than the Biden administration about getting back into the JCPOA. They worry less that Joe Biden is about to start a war. And as a result, they are sort of more open to understanding the flaws of the JCPOA. And again, we've talked about this dozens of times. I'm sure you've read about it even more. But the notion that somehow signing back onto the JCPOA is going to allow for a negotiation in which there is a JCPOA plus is uh, honestly, uh, you know, I try not to, I try not to be too flip, but it is laughable, okay? It is central to Iranian foreign policy that they, uh, that they, you know, we can call it destabilize, interfere, whatever it is. It is central to them that they preserve and grow their role in the Middle East and that they keep their enemies, us among them, the Europeans among them, Israel certainly among them, but also the Gulf Sunni Arabs among them, that they keep them uh, off balance. All you need to do is look at the continuing attacks on our facilities inside Iraq, so brazen and so continual that even the Biden administration had to respond. Now, you know, Dennis characterized that as a, as a, you know, look at them, they're better than the Obama administration. I would say, look at, look at how brazen the Iranians are being. They had no choice. I was just in Iraq uh, about a month ago and I can tell you there is no perception there on the ground that we are being tough to, tough about the Iranians, not among our own people and certainly not among the, the Iraqi leadership. And we saw the entire leadership of the country. Last little point, um, uh, and then, and then you know, as always, I enjoy the Q&A more than the blah, blah, blah up front. Um, Afghanistan, you know, I know that it has been said and probably by people wiser than I that this is a mixed bag for the Iranians. On the one hand, they like the appearance of weakness on the part of the United States. On the other hand, they really don't like the Taliban. You know, they're Sunnis and, and the Iranians are Shiites and the Sunnis and Shiites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, see Wikipedia entry on Sunni and Shiites. I don't, I don't buy that at all. I don't think it's true. The Iranians have provided safe harbor to the Taliban. They have armed the Taliban. They have provided safe harbor the leadership of Al Qaeda, including Osama bin Laden's family. There are still members of Al Qaeda living under supposed house arrest in Tehran under the protection of the IRGC. Sure, I think there are moments when the Iranians think to themselves, God, these guys are jerks and we don't like having them, but the Iranians never felt more surrounded than when we were in charge in Afghanistan and we were in charge in Iraq and they are delighted to see us out of Afghanistan and they are working their darndest to get us out of Iraq. And their purpose there is not for greater stability for the region, it is for greater security for the Islamic Republic of Iran. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. I'll remind people to use the raise hand function if they have a question. Um, you know, neither of you talked at all about the Iran um, proxies, Hezbollah, um, and funding for those um, risks to Israel. Um, could I ask you to comment on that and how that factors in? Why don't I start since we'll, we'll tag team this. Um, look, the one of my points implicitly was once the JCPOA is reconstituted, and look, I'll, I'll, I'm like Danny, I can't be certain that's going to be the case, but I, the reason I believe it's going to be the case is because I think the Iranians need it. And for the reasons that Danny was saying, you know, it, they, they have strikes by their oil workers right now. It's not just what's going on in Khuzestan. This, this has been going on for a couple of weeks. And I have no doubt precisely because the Supreme Leader would like Raisi to replace him, that he can't have Raisi look like he's a complete failure. So they're going to come back into the JCPOA. They're just trying to get the best deal they can. And the implication of that is they're going to suddenly have a lot more resources available to be funding Hezbollah. You know, the, their support for Hezbollah never stopped. Their support for Hamas never stopped, notwithstanding what they were facing domestically in terms of the, quote, maximum economic pressure. And that will be reconstituted at a higher level now. Uh, it's not going to easily rescue Hezbollah because Hezbollah has helped to turn Lebanon into a failed state. But the reality is it's not an accident that the that the that Hezbollah A has 150,000 rockets. 
B, it's not an accident that the Israelis carry out so many attacks into Syria to try to blunt what is the terminal guidance project that Iran is pursuing with Hezbollah. The, the great risk of there being a, a, a war that makes what look like what happened in Hamas and what happened in Gaza with Hamas look like literal child's play is that Israel at some point is gonna to have to contend with the reality that this terminal guidance project is advancing, notwithstanding everything they're doing in Lebanon. At this point, the Hezbollah probably has a couple hundred rockets in it that actually has, it's been able to fit with the with terminal guidance. There's a threshold at which Israel won't tolerate higher numbers. Nasrallah has created a reality of what you might describe as mutual deterrence. We see from the last conflict in Gaza and just what happened yesterday in Israel, that somehow in limited numbers, but in a way that signals a loosening of some of the boundaries the Israelis thought they had with Hezbollah, that rockets have been fired into Israel from Lebanon. Uh, again, at a certain point, it may trigger something more from the Israelis in Lebanon, and Nasrallah has pledged that he'll respond to anything that, that the Israelis do. So from my standpoint, what I see is that in the aftermath of the JCPOA, Iran will be doing more in the region, not less. They'll be providing more means to Hezbollah, I think significantly more, uh, and Hezbollah will have to decide what it does. doesn't mean they're going to suddenly see, gee, decide, gee, let's get into a war with the Israelis. I think there is mutual deterrence, but I can also see Nasrallah miscalculating. Uh, so I see, I see the risk there going up. I don't see it going down. Annie, um, I, I don't disagree with that, with anything that Dennis said. I think that this is this is the challenge. I think the problem is that um, that for too many people inside the administration, and you know, I mean, these guys are. You know, I, I said this. I said this last time. You know, uh, we talked. These, these are smart people. You know, it's not that they're not they're not blind uh, ideologues. Uh, they're not the Obama administration in in some ways. And Ben Rhodes, thank God, is not in the administration. So you know, I think that they are as aware of these problems as we are. They just see a different route towards solving them. But the central conceit here is that it is possible to compartmentalize problems with Iran. And that's where I really disagree with all of these sort of, um, you know, Iran peace processors, if I can call them that, you know, that, that no, no, we can do this nuclear deal and then we can do this other stuff and we can, and it's all separate from each other and we can try to do a separate missile deal and then try to do a separate terrorism deal. That's just rubbish. I mean, it, it really is. And, you know, because we cannot do these, what a new what we entry into the deal will mean is massive escalation everywhere else. That's what it meant after the JCPOA. And the problem is that the Biden administration may think to itself, we're going to have your back, you know, Iraq, we're going to have your back, Israel, uh, when that escalation inevitably happens, but they won't. Because of course, what are we doing in the region? We're turning our back on it, not the reverse. And that's another, you know, implication of Afghanistan. We don't want to be there, right? Trump didn't want to be there. Obama didn't want to be there. Biden doesn't want to be there either. So the notion that somehow there's some backstop to what happens is, is, is to me, you know, not in any way credible. The other thing I would point you to that I think is really important to understand is just how Iran does business with us, right? What happened? Was it last week or two weeks ago? Right. It, a plot was revealed in which the Iranians were trying to kidnap an American, an Iranian American in New York, right? And bring her to Iran, try her, and probably imprison her or potentially even execute her. The first thing the Biden administration did is say, this has nothing to do with our nuclear talks. What does that tell the Iranians? It tells them you have got carte blanche to engage in this other behavior without fear that it will have implications for the nuclear talks. Again, I think that's just that's just bad bargaining. I also direct you finally, just really quickly to a piece that appeared today in the Washington Post. It's an op-ed, but it's called Our Never Ending Iranian Hostage Nightmare. I think you may have had my colleague um, Wang Jiwei, who was a, 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 a 
political prisoner in Iran for 40 months uh, on to talk to you. And if you haven't, I, I really recommend it and would be happy to help facilitate it. But, you know, he's in touch with all of these hostages. They, they, they put a little list at the end. You know, the last hostage was taken just, just a year or two ago. And the Iranians are going to travel ban. There is no travel ban to Iran. At the height of the Lebanese hostage crisis, we had a travel ban in place to Lebanon. There is no travel ban, neither for Iranian Americans nor for Americans. The Iranians have too many opportunities to take advantage of us. And I don't care if we're taken advantage of as a matter of status. The implications for the region and for our allies are really dire. Okay, thank you. Rachel, next question, please. The next question is from Dan Mary Ashton of Nabrith. Just, just a comment on uh, Danny's last comment um, about making the same mistakes twice. And I often wondered why in the, in the 2015 negotiations, uh, there weren't three baskets of negotiations going on at the same time, one on nuclear, one on human rights, one on terrorism. And it appears that that mistake is being made again. But my question does not relate to that. My question is, what about the Saudis? Where do they fit in all of this? Because in the early, the few months of this administration, the Saudis clearly made a move back to, to some kind of, of reconciliation with the Iranians. I don't know exactly where that stands now, but as this plays out, and if everyone is coming back to the table, where does that leave the Saudis in terms of the region itself, and more importantly for us, in terms of U.S. foreign policy? Um, well, look, I, I would say, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't leap to the conclusion that the Saudis are trying to reconcile with the Iranians. I think the Saudis probably did decided to uh, to launch these talks for two reasons. One, they're, they've been trying to demonstrate to the Biden administration that they're a responsible citizen. Uh, and this is a way of saying, look, you know, we, we reconciled with Qatar. Uh, we released um, you know, prominent you know, women activists. Uh, here, we're prepared to talk to the Iranians. But they have absolutely no illusions uh, about the Iranians. And I think what, they, what we're seeing is the Biden administration, given some of the pressures on it, has sought to try to prove it's different than the Trump administration when it comes to the Saudis. And yet at the same time, I think has, in my mind, has demonstrated they understand that we have strategic interests with Saudi Arabia, not only for a whole variety of, of counter-terror, energy reasons, but also because there is a transformation taking place within Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, if we if we had had with with all the you know, with all the decisions, some of which are you know completely unacceptable that MBS made, the fact is, if six seven years ago we'd had a, a Saudi leadership that was prepared to create modernization as a source of legitimacy as opposed to Wahhabism, to overhaul their educational system, uh, to lift the guidance laws on women and empower women, uh, to introduce music and arts, not just into the, the culture, but even now into their, into their colleges, reform, uh, in a sense, liberally reform the, the, the social realities and take away the powers of re religious police, we would have said, where do we sign up? So, you know, you have a reality in Saudi Arabia that is changing. Uh, I think the administration, uh, notwithstanding what was being said during the campaign, has worked to try to create some balance in the relationship and to try to preserve it. I think the Saudis now see the administration uh, isn't going to be hostile to it, which was one of their fears with it coming in. Uh, you know, that said, I think they have lots of concerns about just what is the American position in the region going to be, and it doesn't start with this administration, it goes back to Obama, goes to Trump and so forth. I think they too look at Afghanistan and are uneasy about it. They see what's going on in Iraq and would like to see uh, that the U.S. responds more to what the, the Shia proxies are doing. Uh, so. 
you know, you could argue, gee, if they thought that we were really pulling out, they might have to accommodate with the with the Iranians. I don't see that. Uh, my impressions of their talks is that, you know, the Iranians want to create the, the image that things have been restored diplomatically. Uh, the Saudis seem to be resisting that and basically imposing a set of conditions. So I don't see them moving towards any kind of a accommodation towards the Iranians, partly because they see the Iranians for who they are. An accommodation with the Iranians is, in the end, will amount to an appeasement of the Iranians and it won't, it won't satiate the Iranian appetite. Uh, you know, they know the, Iranians, the Saudis don't have to be taught that, they understand that. Danny? I think Dennis covered that very well. I don't need to add anything. Okay, great. Rafael, next question, please. The next question is from Mark Klein of the ZLA. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to remind people that when uh, Danielle Pletka was a top staffer for Senator Jesse Helms, she helped make that office one of the most pro-Israel in the entire Senate. You should always uh, appreciate that and remember that. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my question, people on the Hill tell me that not only have some sanctions been eliminated by the Biden administration, but other sanctions are being ignored, meaning they're essentially eliminated even though they haven't formally been. Is that true? And secondarily, I don't understand this whole going back to JCPOA. Doesn't that mean that by 2030 or sooner, all restrictions are off and they can develop nuclear weapons legally? So what is the real purpose of going back to a JCPOA that allows them to get nuclear weapons in the next eight years or so? I don't understand it. Okay, who wants to go first there? I'm happy to, and thank you for your kind words, Mort. Uh, those were, those. Those were fun times, um, more more fun than now in many ways. Uh, <laughs> but 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 possibly that's because we were all a lot younger. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, look what they're doing uh, in terms of in terms of sanctions is um, is not enforcing them. So. Under the Trump administration, first of all, there were a whole slew of new sanctions, but in addition, the president exercised his authorities under the International Ec uh, Ec Emergency Economic Powers Act, so-called AIPA, and, uh, and through, his, uh, through various national security directives to, um, to not only impose direct sanctions on Iranian individuals, et cetera, and institutions, but also to impose, um, to threaten sanctions against anybody who was doing uh, business with the Iranian banks in particular, that's really where they're most vulnerable. What this administration has done is basically um, stop enforcing those sanctions. Uh, and that doesn't mean they've stopped enforcing all sanctions. To the contrary, they've actually imposed a couple of new ones. But in the case of um, some of Iran's frozen assets, you know what happens is when Iran legally sells certain things and uh, oil in particular, and it is bought, the, the government that pays for it doesn't um, doesn't pay the money to Iran. It puts the money in a frozen account, in essence, in that country, and Iran doesn't get access to it. But Iran has never been slapped with sanctions for food and medicine. So even though Iran's proxies and lobbyists in Washington all like to suggest that COVID has run rampant in Iran because they don't have the money to buy the vaccine, in fact, there are no sanctions on medicine whatsoever. What this administration has done is essentially sort of with a wink and a nod, say, no, no, you can use some of the money, particularly that's in the Trade Bank of Iraq, but also to pay off the South Koreans. The Iranians took a, a South Korean ship hostage to pay off the South Koreans. No, 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 but they're really only using that for food and for medicine and for basic goods that aren't being sanctioned. Now, any uh, anybody who's ever gotten an allowance since the age of six understands the concept of fungibility. If the Iranians don't have to pay for that out of their limited foreign exchange at home, then they have to do everywhere else. So, I mean, that's how they're doing it. And, and in terms of the, the fight, and this is one of the things I, I really enjoy teaching in my class, actually. Enforcement is one of the biggest problems that Congress had. Congress can put every tool it wants into the hands of the President of the United States, okay? The President of the United States has to execute on that. And that means he has to find and study and decide. And what the Clinton administration did first, and then every administration subsequently did as well, except the Trump administration, and now they've gotten back to doing it, is they don't 
discover, they don't find, oh, companies are doing business with Iran that shouldn't be. We're going to have to look into that. We'll figure that out. You know, we'll find out when that happens and then we'll see. And that's how, that's how um, they are loosening the squeeze, the financial squeeze on the Iranians to try to dangle a little, you know, chum the water, so to speak, so that the Iranians see that there's really more gold at the end of that rainbow. That's the answer to the question. Uh, as for the last bit on the JCPOA, dude, I mean, you know, we all we all know when the sunsets are. All I can say is that the Iranian, that the this administration is fooling itself into thinking that it will have the leverage to reimpose sanctions if Iran returns to developing a nuclear weapon. I think they're living in a dream world. Um, you know, that's a genuine disagreement. Uh, yeah. I don't see it that way. They do. Dennis. Did we lose Janice? I'm trying to unmute myself. Okay, I've now succeeded. Uh, I just want to pick up on the, uh, maybe on each point. I don't have, I mean, what, look, what Danny said about sanctions is right. It doesn't mean that more, because your implication is somehow, or you think somehow that the sanctions overall have been lifted. They haven't, and the Iranians clearly want them lifted. And there's a difference between the sunset provisions lasting until 2030 or not existing at all. The Iranians are enriching to 60% right now. You know, to move from 60% to 90% takes you a week. They're researching and producing uranium metal. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do either of those things. So, you know, they those things will be rolled back until 2030. So there obviously is a benefit in not having them do that now as opposed to waiting until 2030. I agree with, with Danny. The I don't see the leverage that we have uh, to succeed in producing a follow-on agreement unless we change our policy. And what I mean by that is, unless we make it very clear to the Iranians, not that we're gonna prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon, but we're gonna prevent them from becoming a threshold nuclear weapon state, which is what I think they wanna be. I think they wanna be like Japan. Uh, and I think that would be a complete disaster. I think our declaratory policy should be, we will prevent that from happening. We should, they should know it, the world should know it. And I have an article that will appear tomorrow and I think we should be providing the Israelis the massive ordnance penetrator. Because regardless of what our declaratory policy is, uh, the Iranians will probably doubt us, but they won't doubt the Israelis. So if you really want to affect them come 2030 or before that, if you really want a longer and stronger deal, what the Iranians need to understand is we're not going to allow them to have that capability. And if they're not prepared through diplomatic means to reach an understanding on it, then we'll act. Uh, and if they don't believe that we will, the Israelis will. That's the only way I think we have a chance to really head this off. And it's not, I don't see, there's no way of inducing them into changing their posture. The only way to affect them is for them to understand the price of not doing it is too high as they measure that price. Thank you. Raquel, can next just, question, please. Can I just, uh, can I just uh, Diane, can I just pipe up? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Can please. I, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think the, uh, you know, I, again, I mean, I, I think we agree about most of these things. Uh, Dennis, I think the one place where um, I have less faith in the power of the agreement is in Iranian compliance. You know, I, I like, many of us have gone through and detailed every single time we've been surprised by illicit Iranian nuclear activities. My confidence in the transparency of their program and in the skill of our intelligence community is very, very limited. We have missed every single major nuclear development in Iran. And not just in Iran, also in India and in Pakistan and in China, and I could go back a few more years and a few other countries as well. So I, I am really not confident. I believe, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying about till 2030, but I'm not confident that the Iranians aren't going to be up to no good nonetheless. And I think that's a, a big challenge because the incentive for any administration to discover that they're cheating is very low because it will force them to act. And this is what we found with the administration. Just a, a, a. And it's a, it's a fair point, but the one country that has an enormous incentive in making sure they're not surprised is Israel, and their track record of not being surprised is pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> no, no, it's good. It's, my, it's, it's great for us to hear the points of view. So thank you both. Um, next that's question, why, please, Rahel. That's, that's why we like appearing together. <laughs> the next question is from Rabbi Steve Vito. Uh, first of all, it's, it's a pleasure to see both of you talking. It seems like some things do go on, no matter, you know, history keeps, keeps the same people involved. And thank you. Uh, two questions. One is, in terms of Russia, what role will it play as part of the, you know, sort of as part of the, the negotiation and the discussion? What, what, what will it try to do? How will it work? And second, just because it seems like Erdogan and Turkey are, kind of re removing it to being a part of the international community in, in uh, the Middle East, what, what will they do in terms of the, of the negotiation? Where will they stand? And will they have any impact at all? Or is it just, uh, is it even worth going to, into that question? But if it is, give me an answer, please. Thanks. Who wants to start there? You want to go or you want me to go? I don't care. I want Dennis to go. My internet connection is unstable and I lost the last half of the question about Turkey anyway. So you better talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, you asked, I mean, so uh, Steve, you asked about the Russians and Turkey. Look, in the case of the Russians, um, they don't want the Iranians to have a nuclear weapon, number one. On the other hand, they and the Iranians share a very similar attitude in terms of wanting the U.S. out of the Middle East. So the Russians like to position themselves frequently as, as in a sense, being with the Chinese kind of protectors uh, of the Iranians. On the other hand, I don't think there's any, any real trust in either direction between them. They have a, a kind of relationship of convenience. Uh, do I think the Russians will be supportive of us in the negotiations? No, I think they'll take the Iranian side. I think they largely have. Uh, I think the Chinese have done the same. Now, the two of them, what the Chinese don't want is they don't want great instability in the region. If they thought this was going to move towards the Israelis acting militarily, you know, and therefore you had to, there had to be more constraint in the Iranian, Iranian program, you might see that. I can tell you that in the Obama administration, uh, in the first term when I was in it, I was actually sent to Beijing and I basically said to them, if you think we can control what the Israelis are doing, you're kidding yourselves. So to the extent to which the Chinese and to some extent even the Russians come to believe that Israel will act, that actually might affect their behavior towards the Iranians more than, than what we do. Um, as it relates to Turkey, you know, I don't, I don't think they're really a major part of this process. Uh, there's always been this assumption that Turkey and Iran are rivals in the region. Uh, I think that Erdogan has shown that he can play all sides of, of this issue, and he has. Uh, clearly, he was of help to the Iranians in terms of sanctions avoidance. So I, you know, I, the whole... Erdogan relationship is itself a whole separate topic. It is interesting that he had a, a long and apparently interesting conversation with President Herzog, uh, which signals that I think because of the economic difficulties within Turkey, that he's trying to send certain different signals and whether or not we can take advantage of that remains to be seen. Danny? Um, so the only thing I, I, I would add here is that I, I think that um, I think that the, the, that the sort of sword of Damocles uh, that everybody envisions, which is, you know, that we won't act, that the Israelis will, and that that somehow has an impact on how the Russians or the Chinese or others think, is less and less credible. Um, if you go back and, and uh, I, I don't know, uh, I can't remember, Dennis, if you were there um, at, at that event with the Israeli, uh, the Israeli chief of staff when he came to Washington in, uh, I was, I was in June. In but he the came time, in... so there you go. Well, so I was with him while you were with them. And, um, and, you know, I mean, it was a great nerd fest. But he said, you know, the one thing we need to be careful with is the Iranians are really going to reach a point where there's just there's just no turning back. And I raised my hand and I said, 
uh, excuse me, I don't remember when Ehud Barak was in power, but didn't he say that? Didn't he say Iran is shortly entering the zone of immunity? And remember Netanyahu before the United Nations with that funny looking bomb that his kid drew? Yeah, and we could go back further and further and further and look at, you wanna, you know, you wanna abuse Obama over red lines, you can abuse the Israelis just as much over their red lines on Iran. And I don't think it's terribly credible that I've, up to now they have not acted against Iran, that suddenly some cataclysmic thing is going to happen. I think the Iranians have calibrated this very carefully and that they have managed to release very, very well in that regard. So, you know, I'm I'm much less persuaded that anyone thinks that the Israelis are going to act. Um, I, I would I would love to believe it. I want to believe it. I just I'm not entirely sure. So I know that Dennis has a 12 o'clock cutoff. So I'm going to ask, we have uh, two questions that I'd like to give people the opportunity to ask. So uh, why don't we start with Betty Ehrenberg and after that, Bob Sugarman. So maybe we can combine some of the answers uh, to those two questions if they're related. So Betty, would you go ahead, please? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both for being with us again. Uh, this is, uh, it's always uh, a pleasure. I would like to just add a little bit to our worries and focus now on the bad behavior in our hemisphere. And uh, can either of you comment on the uh, negative role that Cuba is playing in all of this in uh, connecting Iran to Venezuela uh, or to any other bad actors uh, in, in our half of the world, which um, is if we don't have, uh, which I think we sometimes lose focus on, but we should pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Bob, why don't you go ahead with your question as well, please? Okay. Um, the present government in Israel and the past government of Israel are basically on the same page with respect to Iran. The present administration is not on the same page as was the previous administration. My question is, do you detect or, or suspect that there'll be any difference in terms of the Biden administration putting either overtly or under the table restrictions on Israel's freedom of action to deal with Iranian activity on its borders, Syria and Lebanon. Thank you. So who wants to go ahead and go first on this one? Annie, why don't you take the Cuban one because you know more about that than I do. And I can, I can respond to, the, to, uh, to Bob's question. Okay, this will be brief because what I know is brief. So uh, first of all, um, uh, Betty, I really commend you to the work of my former colleague, um, Roger Noriega, who wrote a big report on this some years ago and things have only gotten worse. So I think the right way to think about this, and I'm really giving you the sum total of my intelligence on this matter, um, the way to think about this is Venezuela is a wholly owned subsidiary of Cuba. Okay? Cuba manages Maduro, they manage what comes in, they manage what comes out. Uh, the Maduro government has a very robust relationship with Iran. For a long time, there was a, a plane flew twice a week between Tehran and Caracas for no clear reason other than to engage in what I've heretofore described rather gently as naughty behavior. Um, there are a whole series of, of problems here. There's a Hezbollah problem, a Hezbollah in South America problem. There is, a, um, there is a, an illicit oil problem. There is a terrorism and passports problem that the Venezuelans have been very enthusiastic about facilitating for the Iranians, there's a traffic into the United States problem. And there is a problem about which we know uh, there's a, also a missile technology problem. And then there's a problem we don't know very much about. And that is in the Roraima Basin where the Venezuelans have quite a lot of uranium. That's the sum total of my knowledge. If you all are interested in this, Roger is a very knowledgeable source on this issue. And I should probably go ask him because I clearly don't know enough either. Over to Dennis. Thank you, Danny. Um, look, Bob, I'll just give you a couple of data points that shows that uh, there aren't restrictions that the administration is imposing. Danny made a reference to a, an attack that the new Israeli government carried out against a facility outside of Tehran that actually produces uh, you know, parts of centrifuges uh, done by the, by the new Israeli government. This week alone, there have been two different attacks 
uh, into Syria. You know, the Israeli posture is never to acknowledge these attacks, uh, but obviously they take place. Uh, the most recent attack was, was yesterday in an area by Homs that was, the target was, uh, was related to the precision guided project uh, that Iran is pursuing, as I said, related to trying to create guidance, uh, um, accurate capabilities for, uh, for the missiles that Hezbollah has. So there's no, there's been no change in uh, in any of that, and I don't see any sign of change. What is a change is that uh, the new Israeli government has made a a very determined effort to make it clear that they want to restore the not just the the image but the reality of bipartisanship in terms of its relationship with the United States, uh, and uh, and that also its differences that it may have with the United States and the Biden administration on how to approach Iran. It doesn't want to be out there broadcasting it. It wants to be talking quietly about how to deal with these differences and see if we can come up with approaches that overcome them. Uh, the Biden administration clearly appreciates that, and I think it relates to the first part of your question. I think there is uh, much more of a readiness to, to understand the nature of the threats that the Israelis see uh, and, and to understand that the, Israel has to have the ability to deal with him. I, can, I remember when I was in the first term of Obama, which was the only term I was in, uh, in I was in Biden's presence on a number of occasions when, uh, when his position was, Israel has to be able to deal with the threats that it, that it faces and it's not up to the United States to determine what Israel does. Okay, thank you. Rachel, next question, please. The next question is from Malcolm Holmine. Okay. Uh, thank you both. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, I wanted to ask, you, you talk about the inevitability of Raisi's succession, or almost inevitability. What about the role of the Supreme Leader's son, who was being groomed and still seems to be playing a very uh, important role? And second, could you comment, one of you comment about China's role, increasing role, having a new base, a military base uh, on the Gulf, uh, clearly uh, offering to, to help alleviate the pressure on the uh, sector, the uh, energy sector. Uh, and lastly, about the strikes, you, you made reference to it. They're very severe and widespread, but there doesn't seem to get any support from the West, including the United States. Is there something that could be done in that regard? Okay. Danny, do you want to start on this one? I know very little about, uh, I know very little about Raisi's son. Let me be honest. Um, I'm going to go find out now. Not right, but, you see, the uh, Supreme know, Leader's I... son. The Supreme Leader's son. Not oh, right, uh, oh, who was being, I'm sorry, Khamenei's son, who's being groomed, you know, um, I don't, let me put it this way. I don't, I don't think that a lot of the betting is on him um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, you know, Khamenei is in many ways an accidental Supreme Leader. He doesn't have the he doesn't have the 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 real chop, religious chops to have become the supreme leader, and so I'm a little bit hesitant to to think that uh, that he would be able to install his son. Remember, his influence goes away almost instantaneously when he dies, and I think that there's going to be a real power struggle. It, until just a couple of years ago, there was very serious speculation about whether there would be a successor at all to the Supreme Leader, whether they were going to try to move to a different system, uh, one that was more dominated by the IRGC, more of a militarized um, Islamic Republic and less of a clerical Islamic Republic. Now, again, I, I, I don't think any of us know what's gonna happen. And I, the fastest way to make a fool of myself is by predicting Iranian politics. I do that already on American politics, but, um, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put my money on that. Dennis, any comments? Uh, I, I agree with, with Danny on that. I think her assessment is, is exactly right. I do think when the Islamic Republic may be most at risk is when there is a succession to Khamenei. And the reason I say that, you know, as a, as a, I think when I first met Danny, I was actually spending as much time on Soviet issues as I was on Middle East issues. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the Soviet Union in 1980-81, you see a lot of parallels with where I see Iran today. 
nobody really believes in the ideology any longer except those who are served by it in terms of being in power. Uh, what really helped to bring the Soviet Union down was not just the loss of credibility of the ideology, but the, in the end, there was a split in the security services. You don't see that now in Iran, but in a succession period, you might see it. So that's when I think that things might be fraught. The idea that, you know, the Khamenei can create a dynasty in, in Iran, I don't see that. Uh, and, you know, so I, I do think what Danny pointed out, I, I agree with. On China's role, I would, yeah, they're trying to look like they're, they're more of a, a global power, not just in the economic area, but they still have a kind of completely mercantilist approach to the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, if you go back and you take Iran highly touted this so-called 25 year strategic agreement with them, they said very little about it. Uh, one of the reasons they said very little about it because their trade is much greater with Saudi Arabia and the UAE than it is with Iran. Uh, and they, they continue to try to have, a, you know, to be all things to all people in the Middle East. Uh, they try to avoid making these big choices. I don't see them suddenly becoming a major military force in the region. I don't see them having much appetite for any of that. So I would, you know, I would try to keep that uh, in some perspective. As for your last question on the issue of the strikes, especially the oil strikes, not getting a lot of attention in the West, um, I, I think it's one of the mistakes we make. It's not that we're going to change what goes on in Iran. They we're not. But we can obviously give it a much higher profile. Uh, and there's all sorts of reasons we should be giving it a much higher profile, not the least of which is, you know, Iran is hardly an example of a successful state. Exactly. And everywhere where they dominate in the region, those states are failing. So in a competition with them, which should also be political, not just economic and not just military, uh, we should be highlighting all of this. A, a, a smart policy would be doing that, and I'd like to see that. Okay, Rachel. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Rachel, next question, please. Next question is from William Darrow. Hi, thank you so much uh, for being with us and joining us. And uh, I know we only have two minutes left. Uh, so I wonder if we can just talk about the Israeli reaction. Uh, there is this, I don't know if it's a Cold War or a warm war that's going on as we speak, the maritime activities the, uh, uh, and the like, the uh, Iranian nuclear scientist that's going on. What do you see Iran's play or Israel's play being here? Uh, should a JCPOA 2.0 be signed um, as this moves forward? What, uh, what's your crystal ball say there? And again, thank you both for joining us. Go ahead, uh, Dennis, Danny, I know you, you have to hop. Oh, or Dennis? Yeah, okay. Or um, I'm happy to, either way. Yeah. Look, I think there is a, there's an ongoing, um, fundamentally there's an ongoing conflict between Israel and Iran and it's not just, and it's and it played out for real on the ground. Uh, the Israelis have obviously been able to penetrate Iran in a way that is a source of enormous embarrassment to the Iranians. They keep pressing to try to create pressure on, on Israel from the north, from the south. You know, they would love to rekindle another conflict in Gaza. They would love to have Israel under constant pressure. I think that's part of their basic strategy. Israel will continue, I think, to try to impose a price on the Iranians. Uh, and I think, you know, just one thing I would just offer as a, as a suggestion before I go, I would, now that Israel is part of CENTCOM, one of the things I would love the administration to be doing is to be creating contingency planning with the Israelis, bringing in the, the air partners in, in CENTCOM to deal with a set of options to deal with how you counter the Shia militias. If we wanna deal with the Iranians in the region, we have to raise the price to them for what they do in the region. Uh, we now have, I think, some means through CENTCOM to do much more than we've ever done before, creating a kind of division of labor uh, taking the best of what each country has to offer. We should be doing much more of that because this conflict isn't going away. And I unfortunately have to leave. Thanks for having me. Danny, always a pleasure to be with you. Same. Danny, thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, I think what occurs to me, you know, I agree with Dennis, uh, obviously 
completely. What occurs to me is that um, the Iranians have, over the last 40 years have developed one of the most successful, one of the most skilled and intelligent means of uh, furthering their desired foreign policy. And that is the use of proxies and the use of deniability. And uh, other countries have proven themselves much less skilled at it. You know, the Iranians get away with, I mean, murder. Let's face it, you know, Rafi Hariri, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, we could go on and on and on and on and on. This is all Iran's responsibility. I think Israel has finally figured out not that they want to use people to engage in terrorism in the way that the Iranians do, but that they can that they can conduct a similar kind of a stealth war against the Iranians. And then sort of raise their hand and go, who? I'm sorry, what? How did that happen? No, uh, it wasn't me. And 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 let everybody and let everybody speculate. And that speculation itself is so destabilizing to the Iranians. They have engaged in any number of hysterical sweeps through their country, looking for Mossad spy and Israeli collaborators, and they will continue to do so because they are so afraid. And that is because of what the Israelis have been doing recently. And my attitude about that is more power to them. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us and for all of your insights. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for asking great questions. And we'll look forward to continuing the discussion as we move forward. There is always a lot of change and something new to get up to date on. And we really appreciate your doing that for us today.